Now, I have to tell you, I did a um, right angle about this, uh, which should be up first thing in the morning tomorrow. Natasha and I went out to see... Um, what something happened. Did I freeze up? What's going on? Oh, there we go. Um, we went out to see uh, Christopher Robin, and... Um, I have to tell you, uh, th that movie certainly affected me more than anything since um, Greatest Showman. I think it affected me more than Greatest Showman. And um, and I cannot recommend this movie highly enough. And I want to talk about it for a minute. Um, I mean, honestly, there, there are very few times when I have this kind of an endorsement. Uh, but I really mean it. You, you really need to go to the effort to get, to get out there and see this thing. It is really really that good. And um, the the topic of my um, right angle, it's not that it's a movie review so much as it's a culture review, when um, it's, it's got to be five or six times in that movie you tear up. Steve Green started tearing up just talking about Winnie the Pooh on the right angle show. Um, it, the, the point I was trying to make on the right angle show was that coming out of that theater, I realized that that the fun, I, I was, as I say on that episode, I was trying to trying to figure out the word I was looking for. What would I, what would I call this entertainment? Um, you know, was it noble? It's certainly noble, and it's certainly excellent. It's entertaining, it's funny, it's all, what, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I couldn't find it. And it took me a while because we haven't heard it in a while. But the word I'm looking for for this is wholesome and Wholesome has become like such a square label, but in the in the true meaning of the sense, this movie is wholesome to the degree that it provides nutrition for your soul. It is it is something that you that you your body has to have, and it's of the highest quality. Uh, it's the difference between you know having a Snickers bar and a and a Coke for breakfast, or having a you know glass of orange juice and bacon and eggs and toast and you know and pancakes and all the rest. But it. it's just. They're, you, they're both breakfast, but there's an enormous difference. And when I was um, when I was in that movie, and especially right afterwards, it's so moving and it's so clean. You know, it is the it's the farthest thing from boring. It's the farthest thing from you know oh you know Squaresville. It, it's just so clean that you feel clean and when you're when you're done with the movie you walk out of the theater feeling like a better person than you were with, when you went in and you are uh you're just a better person and because the essence of this winnie the pooh thing was captured uh so beautifully in this movie by not only by the the creatures which are, i have to tell you i know they're computer graphics uh but i i simply couldn't tell they, they simply look like talking stuffed animals That's all there is to it but it's it's so sweet and it's so moving and it's so important. It's about important things. And then I realized, um, you know, the reason that people uh, loved Hollywood, that, you know, Hollywood, you know, was Hollywood was because for, you know, 50, 60 years we made movies like this where you came out of the theater feeling better than you did before you went in. Um, you have if you have children, you have to go. You just have to go. OK, you have to go see this movie. Um, and, uh, and it was a, uh, it was a, a signpost, almost like a b barometer for me in terms of how cynical this culture has gotten and how destructive that cynicism is, that, that absolute need to tear everything down to find some rotten motive behind everything. Um, the, uh... When I got back, I, I remember a Kenny Loggins song, I, which I, was, I didn't ever have a recording of, but I remember Kenny Loggins sang a song about Winnie the Pooh. So I went looking for that. It's called Back to Pooh Corner, and it was just a beautiful song before I reignited uh, the Pooh thing, and now I, um, I, I wanted to hear it again. So I went looking for it and found it on YouTube, and also on YouTube, uh, the, the picture, the still picture of this will be in the right angle tomorrow. I found uh, a number of videos that had basically the same vibe, and this particular one that I referenced was called uh, something like the um, was it the dark side or the, 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 the something side? Hang on, this I need to find because I know where it is. Uh, 
in fact, it might be an interesting test to see how easy I can just kind of on the fly bring pictures into this thing. Um, well, I moved it to the drive. Oh, here it is. Um, okay, so uh, let me see if I can pull this off. I'm going to just try one little thing. Everybody be cool now. Don't worry about the lack of picture here. Don't panic. It's going to be just one second, and I'll get this right next time. So I'm just going to – I just need to show you this. Um, so uh, hopefully you can still hear me. It's worth the wait. And Browns, come on, clown. Come on, you idiot. Here we go. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Almost there. Almost there. Uh, right angle. Uh, if this was a real show, I could say, Jim, get that picture we did. Uh, yeah. Okay. Got it. It wasn't too bad. Um, so, um, here's what I'm going to show you. I was uh, I was looking for um, I, I I'm glad you guys are, are there. I'm back. Um, I had to load a new scene here. You'll come back. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Um, I'll go back to it again. Uh, this is this is a YouTube video that I found when I was looking for Kenny Loggins song. And as you can see, uh, it's called The Disturbing Real Story of Winnie the Pooh. And um, I, I mean, just look at that picture. Uh, if you'd seen the movie and then you looked at this picture uh, that says fake and real, if you looked at this picture that says real after coming out of the movie, you would want to find the artist that made that and get them into a psychiatric hospital as nearly as fast as you possibly could. It's just revolting. It's revolting. And here's what's especially revolting about it. The, the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh. Okay, first of all, why do we have to have the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh? If it turns out that it is, in fact, the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh, what does that have to do with anything? You know, I mean, honestly, what does it have to do with anything? The book sold billions of copies. They made billions of people happy, very happy, over generations. I don't know how many now, four, something like that. And... And so the first thing that we have to do in 2018 when a new movie like this comes out and makes everybody feel so good about things, they feel so so good about, about just life in general, that you immediately have to go out there if you're a left-winger and you have to find some way to basically, you know, just urinate all over it. you you got to make it filthy. you got to make it dirty. Um, you cannot allow beautiful, clean things to exist in this society. That's not to say that they don't. But as far as the left is concerned, they have to be destroyed. And this is something I find very, 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 very interesting. What is it about something this beautiful, like the Winnie the Pooh stories, that, that, is, that means it has to be destroyed, has to be brought down, made dirty? The, the, the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh. Let me tell you what the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh is, by the way, because it actually kind of amplifies the point. This video says that there's two disturbing stories, two disturbing parts to Winnie the Pooh. The first part is about Christopher Robin, the actual Christopher Robin, who was the son of um, A. A. Milne, who wrote the books. Uh, Milne had been um, uh, really uh, traumatized by the war, and he was, um, you know, suffering from PTSD, decided he wanted to go out in the country someplace and uh, and try to calm down and get over it. And when he was there, um, out in the cottage, he, he saw his son playing with his stuffed dolls. Uh, and the, you can look, I should have this picture too, I wish. Uh, uh, let me do it, why not? It's relatively easy compared to what it was before. It'd be nice if I could just drag it and drop it here. But um, take a look at this. This is, the, the, I don't know if you've seen them before, but... Uh, It's actually pretty remarkable when you get right down to it. Yep, there we go. 
Um, so uh, now if I can just drag and drop this in here, I'll be a happy camper. Oh, kind of. Okay, I'll take it. Um, pretty crummy uh, image. Let me see if I can find a better one. But at least we're doing this in real time. That makes me happy. Um, yeah, this is a little better. So let's uh, put this up. And then um, presumably there's some way to get rid of this thing. Oops, that's me. <laughs> I bet you I've I bet you I've completely, utterly. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, no good, no problem. Go away. Sorry, we're all learning together. Uh, do I want to remove it? Yes, I do. Hey, hey, how about that? Here's a better version. Um, and we'll just zoom this thing up too. Come on. Um, so these are the original figures. These are the original toys that the original Christopher Robin played with that gave um, uh, Milne the, um, the idea for, for the books. And, um, and they're, they're very simple and they're very beautiful. Uh, but why, why does something like this have to be destroyed? So what is, I guess what I'm trying to say is, do you really want to know what the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh really is? Well, I'll be happy uh, to, uh, to tell you what the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh is. Uh, it's this. Um, Milne, as I say, was suffering from PTSD. He went out to, um, to the cottages out there. His son brought his, his stuffed toys that you just saw, and he saw his son playing with them, and Milne decided to write about these characters. Now, as it turns out, the books became so popular so fast that one of the disturbing real stories of Winnie the Pooh is that the actual boy, the actual Christopher Robin, and there is a real Christopher Robin, um, apparently didn't have a happy uh, ending to this. They said that he was completely overwhelmed. Everybody in the entire English speaking, uh, forget English speaking, everybody in the world who, who, where you could get a book of any kind was basically writing him and saying, oh, tell me more about Pooh and somebody, and, and he just never got out from under the shadow of it, and, and people say he's kind of unhappy about it. There's a movie I'm going to watch eventually called um, Farewell, Christopher Robin, which is apparently about that. So according to the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh, with that particularly vile, um, you know, image... The disturbing real story is that uh, Christopher Robin grew up as a relatively unhappy person and was not willing to um, even to take any of the um, enormous profits that the book generated. Now, I'm not saying that's not sad, but it's not exactly Dickens, is it? You know, that this kid was too famous and too rich and wasn't comfortable with it. I'm not sure that I would call that a dark secret of Winnie the Pooh. The other one's even more illuminating. The other dark, disturbing, real story of Winnie the Pooh is that the pictures of the animals I showed you, the, I think the bear was named Edward. But there was, in fact, a real bear named Winnie the Pooh, named Winnie. And the story of the actual bear intersects with the story of Milne and Christopher Robin in this fashion. A hunter shot a black bear, I think it was in Canada, pretty sure, and an army officer rescued the cub, raised the cub, brought it up, named it Winnie. It was a she. When World War I happened, they, he took Winnie with him into the trenches um, as a mascot. And this was a common thing. People have dogs, sometimes even have lions and things like that. He was a mascot for the particular unit of this Canadian officer who, um, who was over there in World War I, and the officer managed to survive somehow, uh, which is a statement in itself in World War I. And he was going to keep Winnie, but he went to the London Zoo. This is all in the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh, by the way. He went to the London Zoo and saw how well they treat the animals. So he basically donated Winnie to the zoo. And then the disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh is that the uh, animal was eventually stoned to death by angry um, mobs of conservative Tories with, and, and, and stabbed repeatedly with their umbrellas. But that's not actually what happened. What happened, according to the horrible, disturbing real story of Winnie the Pooh, was that Winnie the actual bear lived for 20 years, 
in the zoo, which is a pretty good life for a bear, especially since he'd already been many years old, she had. And because she had been raised by this um, army officer, the real Winnie the, the bear in the London Zoo was so tame and so reliable that it was the only animal that the London Zoo keepers allowed to interact with people. And they would let children go and play with this black bear named Winnie. And one of the children that went to the London Zoo and played with this bear and loved the experience with the bear was Christopher Robbins, son of the guy who wrote Winnie the Pooh. So what he did was he substituted the name of this actual bear in the zoo, and there's a statue of the bear in the zoo, transferred that onto the stuffed bear, who I think was, as I say, was named Edward, and that's how you get Winnie the Pooh. And that, my friends, that is the full, complete, absolutely 100% What's the matter with us? You know, what's the matter with us? Um, this, the person who, who made the, the voice of this video is this 18, 19, 20 year old female. And they put it up there to get hits. And the reason they thought they'd get hits is because they knew that there would be an audience of people their own age who want to know something bad about something good. And that is a market that apparently is not going to dry up anytime soon. Um, you know, when I say, what does that say about us? I don't know how to parse that. When I say us, I mean, obviously, modern Americans, modern people. But I also don't want to be included in that us. Um, Scott Ott's certainly not included in that us. He went to see the movie, and, and Steve Green, as I said, is so connected to Winnie the Pooh, hadn't seen it yet, but he, was, he got all choked up just talking about his memories of Winnie the Pooh. And that kind of separates us from the lower forms of life, like the socialists and the progressives, I suppose. Um, I really think that it does. I think that there's a clear case that could be made that intellectuals in the, in the Frankfurt School understood that in order to destroy America, you had to destroy its moral fiber. Um, and that has been a half a century long process. But it, it's happened. The, the, the destruction of the moral fiber of the country means you have something as beautiful and as sweet and as kind and as, as, as uh, up, uplifting as Winnie the Pooh, and now So you see, Winnie was actually a, 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 a drug addict and a, and, a, and a child molester and all the other things. Somebody mentioned that they think we're past post re, uh, peak, we're past peak um, deconstructionism. I've been saying I think we're past peak progressivism for about two, three months now. I feel it very strongly. People are, uh, it was uh, Ian Little said where people are starting to reconstruct things. That's what I liked about Winnie the Pooh, about the Christopher Robin movie, and the main reason why I really think you need to go see it. Because I, I intellectually knew that this wasn't coming, but emotionally I felt like it was coming. Having been conditioned now by um, these left-wing values to believe in nothing, I still don't consider myself to be brainwashed to believe in nothing. There are a lot of things I believe in, and one of them is this movie, and that's why we're talking about it. But nevertheless, the overall brainwashing aspect and the cynicism of this modern culture brought on to us by the left had me thinking that during this movie, Christopher Robin, I kept this, this nasty feeling in the back of my stomach the whole time, which was uh, when he's going to get run over by a truck or, or, or he's going to explode or, or, or something, and he's going to blow away in the wind and, and we're going to be told, you know, that these things, there was going to be some kind of horrible twist that ended up kicking you in the guts and knocking all the wind out of you, and um, and it just didn't happen. It just didn't happen. Ewan McGregor is one of my favorite actors, and he's so bloody wonderful in this because you have to believe him as a grown man who, who talks to stuffed animals, and at the same time, you have to believe that he's the kind of guy who's so stressed out with work that he doesn't have time to talk to stuffed animals, and he, he it's the whole movie goes around him. Uh, amazing, um, amazing job he did.
But there is no reversal, and there is no twist, and we don't get disappointed, and we don't find out the hero has feet of clay, and, and nobody dies, and nobody, and, and there's no tragic lesson to be learned. And furthermore, there's no lesson of any kind to be learned. Um, we're not, other than the fact, the lessons of, of Winnie the Pooh itself, which is, you know, friendship and, and, and um, this sort of, this sort of, sim this sort of simple wisdom that comes out of this stuffed bear. Uh, Eeyore, by the way, is voiced by Brad Garrett and, and runs away with the show. Is just absolutely drop dead hilarious. Um, but it's there's something about this philosophy that they have that has to destroy the beautiful and the good. And that tells you something, tells me something. What it tells me is what they're selling is so low and so base and so unpleasant and so mean-spirited, like the Soviet Union, where everybody's ratting on everybody else and they have to rat on everybody else. I used to think it was just a moral failing. Then I realized, no, it's a survival technique. If you're not ratting on somebody else, then you're not sufficiently um, in love with Comrade Stalin. So... Um, so you have a world where everybody is envious, everybody's jealous, everybody hates everybody, everybody, everybody hates everything, no one can succeed, everybody has to be pulled down to the last level. And this is what the progressives are selling, and so you cannot have anything, um, you cannot have anything beautiful standing on its own two feet, because it reminds you of how far we've fallen, and that's what I was going to call the episode. I was going to call it How Far We've Fallen, but I decided it was a little too pessimistic considering the movie, so I said, I called it You Can Go Back Again. Um, so this movie is everything that a Hollywood movie should be, and I will just say one thing because I am, uh, I'm very, very, very tuned to messaging in movies, very tuned. And so I was looking for where are the liberals going to insert their opinion into this movie. They will do it somehow. They'll do it some way for sure. Where is it going to be? Uh, Christopher Robin, I'm not giving away any spoilers or anything. Christopher Robin um, works in a gigantic corporation run by old white men who are determined to uh, cut spending and, you know, that means cutting the staff and so on. And I thought the end of this movie was going to be where Christopher Robin comes in and basically talks about how evil capitalism is and, and, and how heartless it is and how you need to, you know, all this stuff. And that's not what happens at all. What happens is Christopher Robin comes in and basically says the answer is that we're not capitalistic enough. We need to sell more stuff to more people. <laughs> Just about fell out of my chair. It's beautiful, beautiful, incredible. So um, anyway, needless to say, it, it, you don't have to go for the political, uh, the lack of the political message. But if you have any feelings of any kind at all, you need to see this movie because it'll just hit you right in the feels. And um, and for those of you that, that you know, have just sworn that you're never going to see another uh, Hollywood movie, I would just tell you, um, uh, somebody's already on it, Eric Blake's on it, um, I know that the reaction of conservatives to, to this ongoing, relentless war that the left has launched on our culture has been to boycott Hollywood. This is not an effective um, uh, strategy, and the, and the reason is simple economics. Uh, it's not just the left. The, the movie industry does not expect to make money on, on movies. The, the nature of things over the hill here, right behind me, is something like this. Each studio has this basic philosophy. Their philosophy is, we don't know what's going to hit with the people. We don't have any idea. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make 10 movies. And we know that seven of them are going to tank. And we know that one of them will break even. One of them will do okay. And we're betting the farm on the fact that one of them is just a breakout hit. And that's where we're going to put most of our resources like you know, uh, Avengers Infinity War, how's that movie going to lose? You know, I mean, is the whole world's going to go see that thing. And so what they're basically doing is they're rolling the dice. This is not just for uh, Christopher Robbins, for any movie that the studio system produces. They're rolling the dice and they're saying, chances are it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail. Um, that's okay, we just write it off. It's not our money. It's not my personal money. It's not like I wrote a check for it. Uh, so if it fails, we'll cover it with, um, 
with the proceeds from the one that hits because nobody knows about where they can get the lightning in the bottle. I've told the story before, but it bears telling again. Um, I, I worked uh, on Sunday Morning Shootout. I did 180 episodes of that show as an editor, uh, all except for the final four because I went over to PJTV. And um, this show was a talk show hosted by Peter Bart and Peter Goober. Peter Bart is former editor of Variety. Peter Goober is a big producer who made the deal to sell Universal to the, to the Japanese, to Sony, for which he was paid $750 million, and which I have no problem with because somebody decided that's what it was worth. Um, but Peter Goober told the story on air of when he was trying to convince these Japanese businessmen and an electronics firm to get into the film business, he basically had to explain what I just explained. And he said he was in a boardroom with all of these Japanese suits and said, here's the, here's the reality of the situation. Uh, seven or eight of the 10 movies that we make are going to, are going to be flops. One of them will break even and one or two of them might be hits. And the, and the Japanese executive at the other end of the table looked at him dead serious and said, well, I don't understand. Why don't you just make hits? And that was their attitude. And that's a rational attitude to an irrational phenomenon. Uh, why don't you just make the hits? Nobody knows what the hits are going to be. So Hollywood basically looks around and, they, and they're putting chips down on all these different numbers. And so if you decide that you're going to boycott a movie and the movie doesn't make money, that doesn't hurt Hollywood. It doesn't care. Hollywood doesn't care. Uh, one of the reasons why the accounting is so crooked in Hollywood is because of this dynamic. So if you're part of a film that's a success like Lord of the Rings or um, Fight Club and you've got a piece of the back end, you'll never see the back end ever. Because it will be because those profits will be cross collateralized into the losses, and um, and so there it is. My point is, you cannot hurt Hollywood by not going to a movie because they expect that the movie's going to fail. But but if the whole country shows up and goes to a movie, then the people that made that movie will mindlessly flock to whatever it was about that movie and try to make a bunch of those. Because this is how the thing works here. Uh, William Goldman, I think, screenwriter, he summed up Hollywood absolutely perfectly. Somebody was asking him to explain Hollywood, and he said, ain't nobody knows nothing about anything. It's exactly right. Ain't nobody knows nothing about anything over there. There's no way to predict it. It's like when you hear... Um, Somebody saying, well, first thing we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to make a viral video. Really? You're going to make a viral video, are you? Okay. Tell me how that works. You'll hear Tide or somebody, you know, or some, some advertising agency says, well, first we'll make, some, we'll make you a viral video. No, you won't. No, you won't. Uh, the only example I can think of off the top of my head of a pre- of people that went out to make a, a video that would do well and actually go viral. The only thing that I can think of is the safety video for Virgin America. Um, but that's how the system works, folks. So if you think you're going to punish Hollywood by not going to their movies, you won't. But if you want to see more stuff that actually makes you feel better than you did when you came out, and if you understand the, the reason why this is important, then you need to go see this movie and see it as many times as you can. Because if it's hit, they'll make more of them. And here's the final thought I had. I was talking to my beautiful wife about this because she was as moved as I was and we're coming home. Um, and uh, two things I want to add. Uh, the first thing is, is that Christopher Robin can save society. Christopher Robin can save civilization. And here's what I mean by that. The future is what we expect it to be. And this is not some hippy dippy, you know, uh, new age spiritualism, visualization and planes and, you know, vibrations and all the rest of this stuff. It's simple nuts and bolts, hardware store logic. Our thoughts determine our attitudes. Our attitudes determine our actions and our actions determine our future. And coming out of this movie, my thoughts were elevated to a level that was pretty much the norm for society in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, early 60s. And I realized that it's 
the ancient old saw about about computer code, right? Garbage in, garbage out. You throw garbage into into the numbers. Garbage numbers go into the computer. Then garbage is going to come out. Um, Gigo. So when a movie like this comes out, it makes you a better person. You feel better. You realize that there are things like eternal truths on 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 things like family and 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 loyalty, happiness. Uh, you know, joyousness, um, a, a, a sort of a, a innocence. All of these things are real and they exist. They're trying very hard to stamp them out, but when you see a movie like this, you realize, no, they're not only did they not stamp them out, they're, they're eternal. These things are immortal and eternal and they're important. And that's why um, you need to go and see it because it'll hit you right. It just, it just five or six times, it's like, Boom. And, and I mentioned to Steve when he was retelling a story about Winnie the Pooh when we shot the uh, right angles yesterday. And Steve got choked up. He couldn't, he couldn't continue for a while. He just really was just about to, to cry. And when he just finished, I said, you know, Steve, I want to talk about that emotion that you're feeling. Because I felt that in this movie five, six, seven times. Um, and and what it, the reason you're crying is not because you're sad or angry or unhappy, you're crying because you're so filled with goodness. There's so much goodness that you cannot contain it all. And this is the same thing for, for anything. You know, when you see a parade of veterans marching by or you're at an air show and you see the, you know, uh, the F-15, sorry, the F-16 demonstration team, sorry, uh, and, um, and something just moves you so much, or we were at a baseball game, they sing the national anthem, and, and you start to get teary-eyed because your heart is bursting with happiness and pride and love and things like that. And if you have a society where people experience that every day, then that will color their thoughts. Their thoughts will be positive, clean, wholesome thoughts. Clean, wholesome thoughts on the part of a population will lead to clean and wholesome attitudes. Clean and wholesome attitudes will lead to clean and wholesome actions like voting. And we will get the government we deserve. Right now we have the government we deserve. And there's no way around that. The way to get the country back and the way to get all of these horrible things undone, we could talk about all these plans that we all have, and I'm look, I'm in the middle of this, but nevertheless... Ultimately, it comes down to you have to make the best citizen you can out of yourself and whatever people you can influence, that's great. Uh, my experience has been relatively extensive in this field. doesn't mean I know everything, but my experience has been that goodness needs to be taught to you by somebody who you respect. And when, um, and when somebody you respect does teach you about goodness, it clicks. There's a, there's a it's not like just some other thing you learned. It's, it, it, it feels right. It, it's like, okay, yes, he's right. And um, we as a society, America in the you know, post-war America, especially, but really for most of our history until the progressives came along in the late 60s, but especially in post-World War II America before the, say, 66, 67, I think that must have been the most wholesome, good, decent society that ever that ever existed on this earth. And I had a thought about this too many, many uh, episodes ago. I'm an enormous fan of Mystery Science Theater 3000, which is also a cynical show, but it's not a dark show. It's not, it's not mean. Um, and, and the fun it pokes is, is, is fun. It's not, a, it's not a dark show. Those of you who may not, if you've never heard of it or don't know it, I'm, I know most of us have heard it, certainly. Mystery Science Theater 3000 is where they take a terribly bad movie and they have um, either Joel or um, Mike, a human, and two robots, which are puppets, watching the movie and making comments about how awful the movie is. And it's hilarious. And it's one of my favorite shows ever, ever. Um, but one of the things that MST3K makes fun of a lot are short films. And most of these short films came from the 50s. And, and the, the, the richest target for this kind of cynical sort of, you know, laughter is, uh, we put our faith in blast hard cheese. Uh, uh, but one of the things that the Mystery Science Theater made fun of the best 
were these um, these shorts that were made all the time in the in the forties and fifties, and maybe even to the sixties. Um, and the shorts are easily mocked because they're things like how like personal hygiene or what to do on a date and stuff like this. And they're from 1950s and they're badly acted and they're badly written. And I remember just thinking, my God, you know, these are just, these are so ridiculous. But it was only much later that I came to realize what is it that, that we're actually laughing at here when we see a movie like How to Go Out on a Date or, or you know, uh, Fundamental Hygiene or Susie's, Susie's Got a Great Posture and, and she's standing at the chalkboard and they're measuring the curve of her spine and all this other stuff that's so easy to mock. What is it that we're laughing at? And I came to realize that what we're laughing at is we're laughing at the efforts of society to make their citizens into good people. That's what we're laughing at. We're laughing at, we're laughing at the idea that society could do things like tell you how, how to be a better person. Um, you know. Uh, and and I, I don't mean to pick you out, Dave, because I think you're hilarious and, and I just love you, man. But, uh, for example, he, Dave just wrote in the comment section, Susie has the clap. Yeah. That's right. Why is Susie? Why does Susie have bad posture? Because Susie's got the clap. Because she's got syphilis. Ha ha ha! You see, and this is the this is the disease. This is the disease. Um, I had a chance to talk with Evan Sayed about this. We got to be pretty good friends. Evan and 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 uh, his partner Karen and my wife Natasha and I were doing a bunch of things together. He's a very smart guy, very funny guy. Evan say it. Um, wrote for David Letterman and was actually pretty close to David Letterman. And Letterman called him on the phone and told him about opportunities for jobs and so on and so forth. So Evan was telling me about when the Letterman show started. And um, I've written a few TV scripts. I didn't get them produced, but, I, but I've written a few. So we had a kind of a mutual vocabulary going there. And um, Evan was talking about when the Letterman show was starting and Evan was writing funny material for the Letterman show. And the producers said, no, no, we don't want this. What now? We don't want this. What do you want? And the producers said, well, we just did a segment on plankton. Come again? We did a segment on plankton. What's funny about plankton? Nothing. That's why we like it. Okay? And then I realized the point that Evan was trying to make, and, and I realized what happened to our society. It became, being funny became square because it had been done. And so we're not going to be funny. We're going to be edgy. And we're going to replace humor with snark. And snark is not humor. Snark is just sneering. It's, it's sneering in motion. That's all snark is. It's just like, this is stupid, that's stupid, everything's stupid. It's just a cynical kind of, oh, you know, you know. And, and that's all that The Daily Show ever was, was just snark. The Daily Show was nothing but these New York elitists going out into the country and finding these decent, usually decent, usually simple, happy people and making fun of them. Some guy wants to build his own rocket in his backyard. Let's pretend like he's really doing it, you know. And then we'll ask him about, you know, all these other things, and then we'll get a, we'll get a fine old laugh out of it. And, and when, he, when everyone was telling me about the, um, the Letterman experience, about the Plankton thing, I said, that's exactly what has happened. We become so cynical that the idea of playing something straight is just not conceivable anymore because it's so easy to sneer at and and nobody has the courage see and that, now now we're on to now we're on to the to the brass tacks here because sneering at something is easy you have this wall of of snark between you and and what you're laughing at <laughs> those idiotic fundamentalists you know those snake handlers and ha ha you know, it's easy to sneer because when you're sneering you've got the armor of being in this kind of position where you're commenting on it but putting your actual butt out there and and being earnest about something being earnest is much harder 
and requires a great deal more courage, which is why so few people are willing to do it. Because it's, because it's easy to make fun of somebody who's genuinely serious about something. And that's what has to be destroyed, is the whole idea that this guy who's building a rocket out of a, you know, out, out of a, a couple of garbage containers or something and, and thinks he's going to fly to the moon. You have to destroy that in this society because if you don't, you're going to start asking questions that the left isn't going to want to, going to want to be talking about. Like, why is this guy doing it? He's obviously not an idiot. He's making a rocket. Why is he doing it? He believes in it. He believes in it. There's no way he's going to fly this thing to the moon. No, that's right. And he may even know that. But he's doing it anyway. And that's what the left has to kill. They have to kill. Um, they have to kill that that honesty and that moral clarity and that spiritual clean, spiritually clean quality has to be covered with mud. Let's just say mud because they're going to go further than that. Um, so it has to be, it has to be destroyed, and we don't have to let it be destroyed. It took a, a great deal, in a strange way, it took a lot of courage to make Christopher Robin the way Christopher Robin was made because this movie does two things that are exceptional. I, I, I watched them in real time just as a screenwriter and as a filmmaker. I was watching them and I was thinking about them as it was happening. I was so impressed by this. Again, I'm not going to give you any spoilers or anything. But in a movie like this, you know, everybody's seen the trailer. If you haven't seen the trailers, everybody at this point knows that Christopher Robin's a grown-up person and Pooh appears in his life and he has to go back and, and you know, and, and help, help Pooh. Um, okay, so in a movie like this where uh, you see this adult person and in, in in this fictional bear, you think that you're going to get 40 minutes of setup. In other words... The way they're going to tell the story is you're going to meet Christopher Robin as a, as a, as a grown man. You're going to follow him through his life. You're going to find out how cynical and how hardworking he is and so on. He's, by the way, he's never a bad guy in this movie. He's just, he's just priorities are in different places. And then 30 or 40 or 50 minutes into the movie, Pooh will appear and ta-da, Pooh! And that's how it's going to go. It didn't go like that at all. Pooh is in the first frame, as I recall. I mean, the movie just starts out with him walking in the forest and the 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 nerve that the, that took and the the genius of it you know no we're not going to make you wait 40 minutes it's like the it's like the um genesis story for all of these superhero things how many times have we seen superman or spider-man retell the genesis story of superman and spider-man which everybody knows how many times have we seen this and and sat in a theater for an hour before the guy puts on the suit Right? That's the point that it becomes a Superman movie, is the point that, that um, Clark Kent rips his clothes off the first time you see the S, he goes into the air. That's when the movie becomes Superman. And in all of these, or the first time Spider-Man puts the actual mask on and goes out there, that's when the movie begins. And I've thought for sure this is what they're going to do with Christopher Robin, but no. It starts out with Pooh and, um, and all the rest of them. So that, I thought, took a lot of courage. And the second thing that um, that I thought was tremendously brave of them, really almost, in this world today, almost brilliant, was that they never, ever, ever, ever made any effort at all to explain this and, what, and how it was happening. There are people who hear Pooh and Tigger and, and the rest of them talking, and they're, they're, they're absolutely flabbergasted. So it's a real thing. These animals really are talking. It's not on Christopher Robin's head. But they make no effort at all to describe how this happens, because you don't need to. It doesn't, because you don't need to. You don't need to. It doesn't, it's not a hallucination he's, he's having. It's not a, a ghost or, or a spirit that only he can hear. Christopher Robin grew up with talking stuffed animals, and now they're back in his life. And that's, and, and, and the other people are as shocked as you would be if you saw a bear start talking. It's beautiful. 
But the reason that's so brave to me is they didn't put a frame around it. They didn't, they didn't make it into something like, you know, oh, you know, Christopher Robbins, uh, like I said, ghosts or hallucinations. No, he was a boy who happened to grow up in a yard where there was magical talking animals. And, and he lost his way and now he's back. And they spend a lot of time showing you how he lost his way. And it's extremely convincing. I just can't say enough about this damn movie. I just love it so much. I, I, I've been absolutely absolutely obsessed with it since I saw it and um and for all the right reasons so anyway um this is what Hollywood used to be and when I say this is what Hollywood used to be this is what America used to be people like my wife for example who grew up in Russia and as a young girl was living under Soviet times America was um was a was a magical land populated by magical things and people got that impression from our movies and they were right to get that impression and they were also right to infer that the society that could make movies like it's a wonderful life um are good places to live and when you actually get here now you're pretty disappointed i'm sad to say um, because the streets in Los Angeles, which is where all the magic happens, are filthy. And we don't make airplanes here anymore. Aerospace uh, is gone. We don't make movies in Hollywood. Hollywood doesn't make movies anymore, ever. You never see movies being shot in Los Angeles. Never once. I've never seen a big feature film shot in Los Angeles, ever. Um, we don't make movies. We don't make airplanes. We don't make agriculture very much anymore. We don't make anything here except for poverty. That's what we make. And... Um, and it's gone from being the richest state in the union to the poorest state in the union. And it's all because of the people whose fundamental attitude is so free of any sense of nobility or honesty or courage or decency that they are ready to destroy the place in order to get their stealing done in time. And, um, and we let it happen, you know, we let it happen. So... Anyway, um, I remember, this is the final point I want to make about this. Lights came up, everybody applauded, and then most people just sat there stunned. I certainly was just, I didn't want to leave, I want to get out of the chair. Because the ending of it is so beautiful, and it's, and it's so perfect. And it hits you in such a powerful way. And I remember just being sitting in the theater, being overwhelmed by this. And I turned to Natasha and I said, honey, this feeling that we're feeling right now, this, this is power. This is power that has been used for evil purposes. When people are this emotionally transported someplace, this is power. And we won't touch it. The left does nothing but, um, but use this power for evil purposes, and somebody's got to get in there and pick up this, this wand and start using it for the, for the purposes it was originally made for, which is to, 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 to make things good. The creative people in Hollywood and, and, and the most creative people in the world used to have the wand of, 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 of um, entertainment, which is not, which as I said last week, is just simply getting rid of the brain and talking directly to the heart. And when you feel how much emotion that a movie like Christopher Robin generates and how much, just how much emotion it generates, and you realize that for 40, 50 years now, people have been using that in a very, very nasty, cynical way in order to get what they want. And we won't touch it. We don't even, most, most conservatives don't even believe it exists. But if you have the, the chance to go to this movie, please do it and please see it in a theater if you can, only because of the experience is part of the experience is the shared communal experience of having other people crying in the same room. Um, and, and when you feel that emotion come over you, realize that the left has known about this for at least 50, 60, 70 years and uses this to poison your mind. And you have to have a poison mind to buy their policies and just look at them just look at the actions and look at the people they are um it's uh, a, a very very big wake-up call for me and it's also a, a very hopeful thing for me because 
you would think that this would be bred out of you, but it's not. It's integral to the human condition. And, and uh, I just thought it was a really good movie. And it needs to be seen. Okay, uh, why don't we go do a couple of questions. I'm going to have to leave relatively early tonight. Uh, I'm going to have to plead workload again, but in any event, um, the power, the power of being able to use, well, I'll just come out and say it, the power of being able to manipulate people's emotions. is It's the greatest single power that we have. Not just politically, it's just the greatest power that we have. And when, if you sound like, if, if emotionally manipulating people sounds fraudulent to you, and I don't blame you for thinking that, just think about how you're emotionally manipulated in um, It's a Wonderful Life, for example. Meet John Doe or Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Uh, there's a very obscure movie out there um, with Anthony Hopkins called The World's Fastest Indian. Cannot recommend it highly enough. And it came out many years ago, I'll say seven, eight, ten years ago. It's about an Australian guy, I think, who has an Indian motorcycle and is determined to break a, a speed record with it. And I spent that entire movie absolutely certain that he was going to end up smeared all over the, the, the floor of the lake bed out at um, Bonneville or wherever they have it. He was so earnest, he was so serious, he was so brave, he was so noble that he had to die horribly. I knew it was coming, and it didn't. It didn't come. It was based on a true story, and I just remember being, I, I remember being flattened, just stuck, struck dumb by the fact that this awful, horrible thing that I knew was going to happen to him based on modern culture didn't happen to him. No, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't die horribly. Um, how about that? Lots to think about. All right, let's see what we got here on the Facebook page. I can maybe do two of these or something, and then we'll have to call it a day. Um, 